Hi everyone, I'm here and I'm here to set the scene for you today with regards to the habitat value of stock roots, hopefully in 10 minutes, and I hope I'm not preaching to the converted too much. Um, so to begin with, I'd like to start with the four key things that I think make stock roots special with respect to habitat, that makes them more special than, say, a, a national park or a paddock. So firstly, um, given the vegetation communities that they represent, they're big and they cover the entire distribution and genetic diversity as well. So um, I've recently done some research looking at um, previous, um, previous work looking at this issue. And one paper by Benson found that yellow box trees, which are familiar to a lot of us, in stock roots compared to yellow box trees in paddocks had much higher reproductive output. So they produced more seed and better quality seed than paddock trees, which is really important for issues like restoration. Another paper by Suzanne Prober looking at uh, iconic woodland uh, ground cover species, the yam daisy, found that although this species was once widespread and now has now really contracted, there's still quite high genetic diversity thanks to these little refuges in stock roots. The second thing that makes them special is that they're mostly free from chemical inputs. Even though to some extent there might be some fertiliser drift from um, paddocks, they still mostly haven't been subject to fertilisers, pesticides, herbicides, things like that. And that means that you don't get these nasty weeds like thistles, Patterson's Curse, any other nasty annual that you can think of pretty much, which really flourish in these high nutrient areas, although they are in, still in stock roots, not to the same extent as paddocks. And it also means without those uh, pesticides, butterflies and other invertebrates and the things that feed on those invertebrates can also flourish. Uh, the third thing that makes them special, and I really like to emphasise this, is that they're messy. They've been left alone. They haven't been cleared up. So this is one stock root just north of Cootamundra, which has since been converted to a seed orchard. And you can see it doesn't look like a paddock. There's lots of trees, there's logs, there's stumps, there's shrubs, there's really thick ground cover. And in these sorts of environments, well, this one in particular, I hope you can see it. I found this bearded dragon who's chilling out on a log, lots of fauna-like logs. Um, and that was a perfect example of how this messiness really provides excellent habitat. This is your typical paddock. It's homogenous, it's flat, sorry. <laughs> it's homogenous, it's flat. All the logs have been swept up into one little spot. And by contrast, this is a stock root. This is uh, north of Stocking Bingle. And you can see the natural depressions that have been left there in the landscape have formed pools. There's all these logs left over. There were heaps of mosquitoes in this one, but there are also heaps and heaps of bats. So it was all that water and log volume that had helped make it such good habitat. Um, the last point I'd like to make is because they're so old and relatively un unmodified, they're special. So old trees we know provide hollows for fauna that rely on hollows, things like arboreal marsupials, gliders, lots of parrots and cockatoos, bats, it's really important. And because they're also unmodified, we can use these as reference sites to act as a benchmark for what we're aiming for in our restoration. So if we have a de heavily degraded TSR, we can sort of say, what do we want it to look like? Here's a good example. So um, threats to this habitat, these are the key ones that I came up with. I'm sure you guys can think of more. Um, excessive grazing does lead to invasion by weeds. And we also know it really inhibits eucalypt regeneration. So if you want those seedlings coming up, um, Crash grazing is fine, but set, set stocking isn't any good for tree regeneration. Firewood removal for fence posts um, and firewood, obviously. Of course, woody debris should be left on the ground. Woody thickening by calitris or cypress pine, although it does benefit some of the little woodland bird species like shrubbiness for other species that's no good. Uh, inappropriate fire regimes and finally loss to freehold tenure and road widening. So because they're already quite narrow, um, losing every metre to the roadside is a little loss of habitat there. Um, so I often catch myself out saying things like, oh, you know, stock roots are great because they sampled the landscape in an unbiased manner and represent all vegetation types, when in fact they, they don't really. They are biased and they're biased towards low-lying valley areas. So what this, this graph shows you, um, this is from a paper we published two days ago on ecological management and restoration. It shows that on the right there is the National Reserve System. 90% of the National Reserve System is on 
highly sloping erosional ridge top areas. So all the vegetation types that occur on these ridge tops are represented in the NRS. Whereas in stock roots, which are on the left there, 55% occur in low-lying valley areas. And these are the really fertile, well-watered areas of the landscape that have been preferentially cleared for agriculture. So what that means is that the vegetation types, like I said, that have been cleared are now existing in these stock roots. This data was um, put together by the, what was the Department of Environment, Climate Change and Water last year. And it just shows on that one section of the stock root network all the different threatened ecological communities that are occurring within it. So I've included some that I've come across in my field work. And these include, just to give you some nice pictures of woodlands, um, river red gums, inland grey box, eucalyptus microcarpa, white box woodlands, eucalyptus albans, mile woodlands, acacia pendula, and bimble box woodland as well. And on, oh, you can't really see it. There's a bat detector on that tree, but oh well. <laughs> So these are just some examples of the high diversity of these really threatened vegetation types that you can find in such a small area on the stock roots. Um, now, what we know of what is occurring within the Long Paddock, this is the data based on the New South Wales Wildlife Atlas. So this is what we know is occurring there. And what the atlas shows is that there are 17 species of amphibians, but those are the only records. There are 109 species of reptiles, but you can still see some big gaps in there two species of insect, which I think is a bit of an underestimation, but oh well, um, and only just north of Canberra. Um, 91 species of mammals. I haven't actually taken out the exotics from that, so that probably includes lots of foxes and rabbits and stuff. And 196 species of birds and 15,000 records. So what I basically wanted to show you with this is that there are a lot of unknowns and biases towards certain taxonomic groups, and we haven't done any systematic surveys. So we don't, we don't really know what's there still. And we wanted to um, show this in a paper, the same paper that we produced recently. This diagram, we just wanted to prove that based on what in the published literature, the scientific and the grey literature, that there are things that are endangered in stock roots that either we're just rediscovering or it's their last little stronghold. So some examples we came up with was the Regent honey eater, another one of these iconic woodland birds. <laughs> Woo! One of these iconic woodland bird species. The Tumut grevillea is sort of just hanging on in one, well, there's 10 sites, one's a stock root. Uh, the wandering peppercrest was rediscovered in a stock root. The Julia Creek dunart, they've rated TSRs as one of the last good quality habitats that it might be occurring in. The other thing I wanted you to take from this slide, we included it because it really shows in the black is the stock roots, in the green is the protected area system, and it shows almost what looks like pre-designed connectivity across the landscape. So if you looked at that and you go, oh, that's a nice corridor network, but it wasn't intended to be corridors, of course. But if species in climate change are going to have to start moving out of their, their distributions and shifting, that looks like a pretty good way of shifting to me if, if it stays there. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to go over some of the work that I've done on the southwest and central west slope. So uh, there's 32 sites stretching. This is... Kuta Mundra, and this is Forbes up here, and then Young's in here somewhere, and West Wyalong's just out that way. So we've got 32 stock routes that we've done wildlife and veg surveys in, and also 24 paddocks. Um, so this is our study design. There's a stock route here. We called it a remnant, just for the international audience who don't know what a stock route is. Um, and then we had sites 100, 200, and 400 metres into the paddock as well. And we surveyed a range of stock route widths and conditions, so narrow intact narrow degraded, wide intact, wide degraded, and five different paddock types. So native and exotic pastures, canola, lucerne, and wheat. And this is what we found very quickly. So firstly, we did bird surveys. We recorded 81 species in those stock roots. And we found that structural complexity of the stock root, like that slide I showed earlier with the logs and the shrubs and the leaf litter and the peeling bark, that's really important for birds. But so is the, to a lesser extent, so is the width of the TSR. So bigger TSRs, more birds. Kind of obvious, I know. Um, we also surveyed native bees using blue vein traps. We collected 36 species, and we found that proximity to other conservation lands, so big conservation areas, are important for bees. But so is a, a lot of mass flowering crops, so vicinity to canola, lucerne, things like that, where they can forage, but they also need nesting areas. So you need to really maintain this mosaic of of farmland and also conservation. The last group that we looked at was microbats. Um, this was last summer. It was 
very, very wet, as you're well aware. We recorded lots of insects and lots of bats, got 1.2 million calls. We're still sorting through them all. But my educated guess is that for bats, you need lots of large, old, hollow-bearing trees and also a proximity to a water source. So what I want you to take home from this is that whoop, landscape context is really important. So if you're in a, a stock route that looks like it's not in great nick, if you're next to a native pasture that has lots of trees and lots of hollows in it, then that acts as supplementary habitat. If you're close to a con another conservation reserve, that also acts as supplementary habitat. So you can't consider stock roots just in isolation. You've got to also consider the landscape context because this is showing up in our results to be really, really important. Um, that's all I have time for. So these are some of the cited works that I've included in this talk. Um, I'd like to thank all these people, because I didn't do any of this by myself by any means. Um, especially Leslie, who's here today and came out and helped me with my bird surveys. Um, also the people who gave my project money, my supervisors, my volunteers, and all the property owners across the South West Slopes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.